So the real question is, should we be transitioning medically 13 and 14 and 15 year olds? We're taking the breasts off of girls before they've had their breasts touched in a romantic relationship, before they've wanted to have a baby, before they've conceptualized that maybe they would like to breastfeed. And we're making them sterile. And so the sterility and the irreversibility of mastectomy makes us pause, you see. It's very clear we can masculinize a female body, we can feminize a masculine body, but the question is, should we? Should we? Gone are the days when you come across a child with poor body image and you say, hey kid, you're gorgeous, especially on the inside, and pretty soon you're gonna realize that's what actually matters. No, now, if you come across a child who's suddenly suffering from dysphoria so much that they feel they're born in the wrong body, you're supposed to say, yeah, you're right. Matter of fact, let me go find a doctor who can fix that for you. But does the science support that? Keep watching this report to find out. Dre Humphrey here with Rebel News, and new peer-reviewed research has found massive flaws in two Dutch studies that have been internationally pointed to as the scientific reasoning for why kids suffering with gender dysphoria should be rushed into affirmative care and often medically transitioned. Today, I bring you a sit-down interview with a clinical professor of psychology. He even founded a gender identity clinic at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. That man is psychiatrist Dr. Stephen Levine, who now runs his own private practice which specializes in human sexual problems. Dr. Levine is one of three doctors who champion the new research we are about to discuss from the peer-reviewed article called The Myths of Reliable Research in Pediatric Gender Medicine, a critical evaluation of the Dutch studies and research that has followed. Now, if you appreciate that, unlike what you'll hear by the state-backed legacy media, we are bringing you this important research You can support our independent journalism by going to rebelnews.com and clicking on that donate button. Here's Dr. Levine. Dr. Levine, thanks so much for being on Rebel News today. My pleasure. Now, you and a team of two others did some really important research. I'm not sure if it's going to get the amount of attention it deserves, uh, but I think that it's very important that you're on Rebel News and that people need to hear this. So, The first I wanted to talk about is the two Dutch studies that have worked in some ways as a foundation for the point two research when it comes to medically transitioning children. What can you tell us about those two studies and how they've influenced that field? Well, the two studies are the, quote, scientific, unquote, justification for what is going on with the rapid affirmative care or medical transitioning and surgical transitioning of uh, today's youth across the world, transgender youth across the world. And it's important to understand that this study, even though the WPATH, uh, the World Professional Organizations for Transgender Health, uh, and uh, the Endocrine Society, both cite these two studies as the scientific justification for affirmative care. Mm-hmm. Nobody, un, no one until recently has pointed out the limitations of this study and how it has been misused to justify affirmative care. This study is biased. It was, it was begun uh, many years ago, and uh, it, it ended up in publication in 2014, Uh, And all the subjects in the study were kids who were transgender identified from early in life and uh, had an intensification of of their dysphoria with puberty. They were all thought to be mentally healthy and had supportive parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so they were treated with puberty-blocking hormones. And some of them then went on to cross gender hormones, and some of the, and then they went on to surgical procedures. And the 2014 study gave uh, 
outcomes on 55 of the 70 original people um, uh, after up to a year and a half. Okay. Uh, now, the trouble is that when these kids were entered into the study, um, it was a time when most of the transgender people that were recognized were like the kids in the study. But today, most of the new people asking for transgender affirmative care are very much unlike the people who are in those studies. And that, that is, they had normal gender identity mm -hmm. until puberty, and then they began having transgender feelings in with puberty. So the rapid onset gender dysphoria, is in that way? It you... had what we now call, or some of us call rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, so the, the important point here is that while these two major organizations use this as a scientific justification. The sample is so different that we can't assume that they're comparable. Huh. Uh, the other thing, uh, there are many sources of bias. The other thing is the Dutch people gave, the Dutch researchers made sure these children who were healthy in the beginning yeah. had ongoing psychotherapy. So if to the extent that people think there was a good result, you can't separate the good result that came about from affirmative care versus the good result that came about from the concomitant treatment with psychotherapy for the parents and the for the family and for the individual children. Right. And I'm not sure of this, but is it at all routine for children who do go through transitioning to keep up with psychotherapy? Is that part of the process? Well, or you see, part of the problem in the United States and elsewhere has been the affirmative care has been thought to be the primary and the most important and only necessary treatment. Right. Mm -hmm. So so that makes it so and so the other thing that that's so different is that at least 70% in some studies of the kids who ask for trans care in adolescence have already been identified as psychiatrically having psychiatric diagnoses or emotionally disturbed children. So so those people were excluded from the Dutch study. So now we're, we're, we're using the Dutch study to apply to kids who are mentally, a large, large percentage of them are mentally symptomatic. Uh, they're, 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 they're mentally symptomatic and they have rapid onset gender dysphoria, which is totally unlike the Dutch protocol. So. The other thing is the Dutch protocol claimed that the gender dysphoria was eradicated. And what my colleagues and I point out is that, that the, eradif the eradication of gender dysphoria was in fact an artifact of how they, the questionnaire that they used to identify this. And uh, so these are the sources of bias. These are the sources of, of why we can't say that science has proven that this is the best treatment. And as you probably know, Finland, Sweden, the UK, to some extent Australia, New Zealand, and France have all begun to say, listen, the first treatment for these kids need to be paying attention to their psychiatric problems, and they should have psychotherapy alone and with their family. And then and then if we're going to have to if we're going to transition kids they ought to be transitioned in a controlled research protocol rather than just just from a local clinic uh, because in the past we've had no follow up the the other concern that we've had about about the dutch study is that the follow up was between 12 and 14 and 18 months and what really is the issue here is it what happens to transgender, uh, trans transition kids, either with hormones and or surgery, uh, when they grow into their 20s and when they go into their 30s? Because the snapshot that we have from cross gen cross sectional studies of adult transsexual populations is that they're not doing very well. Right. Yeah. And so, so the real question is, should we? be transitioning medically 13 and 14 and 15 year olds. And you know, if you want to bring this home very, very dramatically, 
you have to recognize that we are taking the breasts off yeah. of teenage girls who are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. We've been taking the breasts off, and we call that top surgery to, to, to as a euphemism, not to say that it's a bilateral mastectomy. Yeah. You see, we're taking the breasts off of girls before they've had their breasts touched in a romantic relationship, before they've wanted to have a baby, before they've conceptualized that maybe they would like to breastfeed. And we're making them sterile. And so the sterility and the irreversibility of mastectomy makes us pause. You see, it's very clear we can masculinize a female body. We can feminize a masculine body. But the question is, should we? Should we? Especially so young. Many times they can't even drive. They can't vote. They can't go and buy smokes or drink. Now, And they can't anticipate what they will feel like in an intimate, mutual, loving relationship with a partner, an age-appropriate partner. Mm -hmm. So these, this is very, this is premature medical treatment of a very serious problem, but it's a psychological problem when one doesn't feel comfortable in one's own skin. And this can be approached as all other psychiatric problems in teenagers are approached with psychotherapy why we've invented a unique medicalization of a psychological problem uh, uh, is makes some of us scratch our heads but that makes us very apparent makes it very apparent to us that if we tell ourselves we doctors tell ourselves that this is a genetically uh, dictated problem that it's immutable and that it, the people will kill themselves unless we intervene then it makes it quite justified that we do this. Absolutely. But it's not immutable, as we can see from the detransitioners that are appearing. Um, it's not clearly biologically caused any more than all of us come to life with a certain temperament, yeah. temperamental predisposition that then interacts with our families and our environment to create our personalities, mm -hmm. you see. And, and, uh, and the people, most of the people don't, don't, most of the people who have suicidal ideation, which is extremely common in all forms of sexual minority people, most people with suicidal ideation do not kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is that the suicide rates of people who have completed all the transitional services that medicine can offer, the suicide rate in that group of people is higher than the general population, sometimes dramatically higher. So... Again, come back to the question. We can medicalize and help people appear like they, like they are a member of the opposite sex, but should we? And then the question is, when should we? Okay. Should it be at 13? Should it be at 17? Many of people think it should be only after 25, 26, when the brain seems to be as mature as it's going to be in terms of being... The, men, the medical process is remodeling the brain. So the, this is an area that ought to be controversial, and it is controversial, and controversy is how medicine advances. If everyone agreed with every treatment that is being done, we would never advance our treatments. You're referring to this, of course, as a psychological disorder. There's a lot of people who get offended when you use that talk. I know in the D, uh, DSM it was gender dysphoria was in fact listed as a disorder. What is it listed as today? Well, it's ambivalently listed as a disorder only for insurance purposes. You see, this is part of the great ambivalence here. Um, it's it, it, we, we don't want to call it a disorder because we don't want to discriminate and add to the stigma of people who choose to live their life this way, whether they feel they had any choice in it or not, you see. So we don't want to discriminate them, so we take it out of the mental illness category. And in ICD-11, it's, it's put it in the category of uh, situations or factors that uh, contribute to uh, uh, sexual health. Uh, but in fact, it, we treat, 
we can't give hormones to people with non diseases. We can't take off organs, healthy organs, to people who don't have a disease. So we're ambivalent about this. See, we, we, we historically, transsexualism and gender identity disorder were mental diseases. It's only recently that they're no longer thought to be diseases. Now, one of the strangest things to me is that all forms of gender identity are declared to be normal. You see, even though we see that 70% of these kids have psychiatric diagnoses, and if you're a clinician like me, it's hard to convince yourself that the people coming to see you who have social difficulties and who are depressed and have suicidal thoughts and, and repudiate their body and hate their body parts, uh, that this is called normal, you see. But that's what the official designation is. But I think we should understand the motivation for taking it out of a psychiatric category of illness was to decrease the stigma and to make the difficult lives of trans people a little better as society accepts the, the legitimacy of, of, of living as a trans person. But in order to accept that legitimacy, we often have to invent ideas that are not true, like it's biologically caused. Now, it may be biologically caused, but no one has the evidence that it's biologically caused today. Now, what advice, if any, do you have for a parent who hears sort of that standard thing if they don't go along with the affirming or even encourage their child to believe this, even if their child's on the fence, that their child may in fact kill themselves? Uh, well, I'd say don't believe it. Don't believe it. That's the most unethical thing, the most coercive thing that a, that a affirmative care therapist can tell parents. They instead need to tell parents what the state of the knowledge is, what the state of the lack of knowledge is, and the fact that it, the data that we do have says that the suicide rate among people who have completed all the work is what's higher than the general population. Now, though, adolescents who kill themselves, who are trans, kill themselves at about the same rate of, of adolescents with mental illness, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The vast majority of, ki of people who have suicidal ideation are, are not going to kill themselves. We just have to figure out which ones will and which ones won't and, and appropriately treat them with things that we know in psychiatry to take care of, how to take care of suicidal kids. Well, let me know what you thought about what Dr. Levine had to say in the comments. And if you appreciate the independent journalism that Rebel News brings you, please consider keeping our lights on and keeping us bringing you reports just like this. You can do so by going to rebelnews.com and clicking on that donate button. We appreciate your support and I'll see you next time.